Esteban Cabeza de Vaca, born in 1985, grew up in San Isidro, one of the largest border towns between the United States and Mexico, and the site of last year's migrant caravan crisis. Esteban's work emerges from his mestizo culture in the southwest United States. He's attended many residencies, including the Carizoso Artists in Residency, Drawing Centers Open, Ses Drawing Centers Open Sessions, the Rice Academy Van Bilded in Kunsten, and the LMCC Workspace Program, and the Sharp Valenta Studio Program. His works are among public and private collections worldwide, including Harvard University, the Netherlands Bank, Stern Collection, the Duhus Collection, uh, and he holds a BFA from the Cooper Union and an MFA from Columbia University, where he currently teaches painting. Esteban's first New York City solo show, World Without Borders, at Borsley Gallery, was featured in New York Times as an artist to watch now. He lives and works in Queens, New York. It's really Thank you guys for uh, inviting me. Um, yeah, I, I want to thank uh, Lisa, Lisa Kern Davis, and then also everybody, uh, Emily Jovic and Miko Beltkamp for inviting me. Um, yeah, I hope you guys enjoy my lecture. I'll keep it to like like 45 minutes or so. Um, but yeah, let's get started. So, where am I? based on my ancestor, uh, Alvar Nunez Cabestabaca, who uh, came to the United States in 1527, part of uh, the failed Pantido de Narvaez expedition. And so he came to the New World as like a, a conqueror, but then like left advocating for a grand alliance with Native American people. So he got shipwrecked because they didn't know, you know the layout of Tampa Bay. And you know from 500 uh, colonizers, uh, he got narrowed down to just five survivors of this whole uh, expedition. And um, so he had first contact with like a lot of Native American tribes like the Karakawa, Kapoke, Han. And um, at first, you know, he, they, they would like have different uh, interactions with one another, but what ended up happening was um, he became enslaved to, to Native Americans for about five years. And a lot of Native Americans uh, around 1527 were dying from smallpox and influenza brought over by Europeans. So they they kind of rationalized if these Europeans brought like the disease, maybe they also carried the cure with them. So they started to use my ancestor in uh, faith healing rituals, which ended up ha uh, gaining his freedom. So for the next like three years before he uh, went to New Spain in Mexico City, he ended up. Um, becoming a faith healer and like whether some parts of it are sort of true or not he he ended up like advocating for native americans rights before, way before um a lot of people like uh bartolome de las casas and other people advocated for indigenous rights um so um his chronicles and like his way of thinking and, and like is sort of like a gateway into me thinking about my own work um so that's So that's the trip. Um, so this is where my mom was born, and I was just born literally right on the other side, but we'd go every weekend to Tijuana every week um, to visit family and, and see them and stuff like that. So for me, this was like a big visual inspiration for me and just to see how, how people, specifically like uh, refugees, I, I prefer to call a lot of these people that are uh, coming to the United States as refugees because of all of the puppets and government toppling that the United States did in the 80s with Ronald Reagan, um, are just trying to flee violence that the United States created in South and Central America. So 
you know, when I'd go visit family and stuff like that, I would just see the way that they lived life, but then also let them, if they were illegal by the government, we'd let them stay in our, our basement until they got, you know, their footing and, and let them go on to live their life. But I just feel like this is just a, like a visual reference for something that I saw every day growing up. Um, this is like one of my earliest paintings. I've never shown this to anybody before. So this is like one of my earliest paintings I did in 1985. But I don't know if this, I just, sometimes I was, you know, I was like a fat little kid growing up. And most of the time my parents were like, just stay inside, don't go outside to play and stuff like that. And so like most of the time I would just stay inside and draw all the time. And then I'd hear stories. And in San Isidro, most of the time it's pretty boring, except at nighttime when there's like a lot of helicopters and sometimes people try to steal cars or just other things. So like I, you know, a lot of the time I'd see nothing going on, but then at nighttime I'd see things. So I think this is kind of like a register of a lot of the things I was thinking about growing up and seeing, um, but only secondhand, never always, always like this violent. But. Um, and then, also, like some of the people that I was really inspired by were like Goya's black paintings a lot. Like, I saw so many things just not in museums growing up, but just in books that you get at the local library. So I think some of the people that I, I really gravitated towards at a really young age were like Goya. And now looking back on him, he's sort of like a gateway into seeing how Europeans spiritual beliefs were projected onto Native Americans because they thought, you know, polytheism was like pagan and Satanism and like, you know, matrilineal societies were, were a product of the Satan, of, of Satan, sorry. So I kind of like not only like that mystical quality, quality of Goya, but then also thinking of using him as like a gateway to think about um, how Europeans saw back then and saw Native Americans. Um, and then I, I went to like Denver School of the Arts, like probably around like the uh, 95, I was like 10 years old, and then I left when I was like 18 years old. So from like 10 to 18, like I was taught by my professor Daryl Tomlinson to paint from observation every day, but to also do clay sculpture. So I feel like this is a, a photo from a few years ago, um, but it's still with me to go outside and paint every day. And I love just going to old, old sites in America for, for just, uh, whatever, reflection. Uh, this is a photo of me with uh, Edward Hubert and John Warrior. They like curated me in the show uh, Home Not Home. And I feel like conceptually what I get away with like uh, from Edgar is his monument series where he would just play put placards onto different sites in America to give recognition that these places, and even like thinking about New York City and right now we're like sitting on Lenape land or like Mohawk land, but that like my people never thought that they owned the land, but that they were part of the land. And I feel like, you know, just putting a sign there to like change and flip people's perception of home is a good way uh, that I try and think about my paintings sort of doing. Um, but you know, it's not obvious and I don't care if it's obvious. But And then the, the painting on the right is uh, John Quick to see Smith. And uh, she's like a mentor of mine and, and I've been like hanging out with her recently and, and just keeping up like a correspondence with her. But she's only now getting the recognition that I think she deserves like many other uh, female uh, painters of color that got ignored for a long time. Um, so this is a painting that I was really inspired by. It's called like Fear. And you'll see it coming up later. But uh, she, she, she tries to teach in like her pedagogy to, to work more with like acrylic paints and oil paints. And she has this one nomad manifesto and I use this in my art class as like a, a way to get people to make nomad art or like it's biodegradable, but it's like convenient for countries which may be disbanding or reformed. So I don't know, just something to think about in the age of global warming. Um, some of the people that I kind of have an like, antagonism against are sort of like Jackson Pollock. I kind of like think of him as like somebody that appropriated Native American culture. And I, this is like an ex exhibition on the right that he probably most certainly saw at the MoMA. It was like curated by Alfred Barr. But it basically had like Navajo sand painters performing their identity, almost like zoological animals. So then like these white museum viewers would like see it safely at a distance, but then they're like 
almost like performing an ancient ritual and they're like safely tucked back in time so then you know they wouldn't but anyways so he Pollock would talk about how he was inspired by Navajo Sam painters and for me I I want to use the drip as a way to extract out this this hidden history that's cemented in the American landscape so sort of almost as 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 the same way that like Native Americans use my ancestor to help with the cure against like this invasion from Europe and almost using Jackson Pollock's trip as a way to like immunitize myself from like the weirdness in art history or something like that. Um, some painters that like uh, that I was really inspired by. I moved to New York. I transferred from the museum school to Cooper Union and. Um, some of like my first professors was Jason Fox, and um, he's married to Huma Baba, and they just kind of provided like a friendship to me, and they always like are open for me to hang out with them. And I, I think what I enjoy about Jason's work is that he mines comic books, but science fiction, and, and thinks about figuration. But he also has like this really honest relationship of discussion with his wife. Huma, who's just this phenomenal sculptor that's looking at ancient Middle Eastern history, contemporary like history, Orientalism, and then, but then just also like deranged, self-taught, fragile modes of making art that I just really like. Um, another like my final kind of inspiration that I'll show you. I got a lot, but I'm just gonna keep it secret. Um, is uh, Basquiat and Philip Gustin, and like Gustin would kind of talk about how you're never done with a painting until you feel as though like a third hand has kind of come in and finished it off for you. And um, he'd also kind of talk about like a competition between the means of painting and the subject matter. And I think that that's really important where you kind of destroy things and rebuild it. And, and Basquiat would kind of have this quote like boom for real where you you sort of build up the layers, but then like destroy them, and instead of rebuilding them like it, a cubist would, like almost like weaving pieces of textile together, you'd almost form like this strange constellation, like a breakdown of melody or something like that. So I don't know. I just really like both of their ways of working with figuration. That's kind of um, constructing, but also deconstructing it as well too. Um, so this past year, I moved back from. Uh, Europe. I was living in Europe for the last two years, um, and I got to go see a lot of art that I always saw in books. And this is like some some work in the Louvre of of treasures that were when Mexico was a colony of Par of, of France. This is like a weird like sculpture that I think a heart would go inside of. Um, but I, you know, I constantly think about how these objects are separated per permanently from these societies that you can never repatriate these objects back to because those cultures are completely gone. So they're sort of like silent. They can't tell their story anymore. So I kind of think about how as an artist I can kind of reactivate these objects in a way to give their story relevance again. But there were some really cool paintings in Europe, you know, there's like El Greco. I love El Greco so much. and then. Bernini sculptures, but I would just still like I'd see this crazy marble that's so beautiful, and I'd just be like, where the hell did they get all this sculpt like stone and marble from? It's crazy, you know. So I'd sort of like think about like all the slave labor and weird labor that's not accounted for that took place during like the Renaissance and like so. This is like a photo of like just a for rent sign in Spain. Like I just really this is an art, but it was just like a window display, but I just really liked how they're just finding weird, you know, fugitive objects or something like that and assembling something in a makeshift way that's, you know. This is some graffiti from Spain. And uh, I think whenever I'd come back home to the United States in between, you know, for Christmas break or something like that, when I was doing the residency at the Rice Academy, I was thinking about like American graffiti or like thinking about like ancient graffiti that stood the test of time through uh, colonization and kind of using that as like a gateway vision to seeing like another reality onto the landscape that doesn't like dominate it but maybe is like interconnected to it in a different way. So I, uh, I made this painting pretty much when I moved to Europe and it was just super cold there and I, 
I, I just started painting in orange, I think, as like a way to kind of charge my soul. Like it wasn't really like a conceit, like I was gonna like make orange paintings, but it was like, it's really cold there. And initially it was like an image of these Dakota Access Pipeline protests that I was participating in in New York, but it just didn't stick. So I just like covered it up with like this image. So this abstract gesture stuff. Um, and initially with this, I started out with like an image of like these chronicles of my ancestor, Alvar Nunes Pustavaca, that he documented the slavery of indigenous bodies in the new world. And I think another part that I'm starting to uncover within, you know, thinking about the other slavery that happened in this country of uh, uh, indigenous bodies and how the border is a siphon for this uh, other slavery that's still happening right now and controls who comes in and who comes out. So that was sort of my thinking process with that thing. Um, it's like a powwow thing. I, I missed America a lot when I was there. And this is sort of like non-representational painting of the powwow thing. Uh, no comment. <laughs> This is like kind of like talking to my ancestors a little bit. And uh, th around like the end of my first year in Europe, I, I made like this painting. And I think it just kind of came out of like, this urge to make a, make those signifiers of, of what a wall would be, but also incorporate that makeshift creativity out of, out of nothing or out of very limited materials, so then to kind of puncture that too. So that's kind of where this painting came out. And then uh, I fit, this is like the conclusion of my final year. So I was working with ceramic, but also making masks, and then also making like pottery that's sort of like a fusion of, of them all. So. I collaborated with my partner Heidi Howard on, on like the way that I made this pottery and but everything else like the painting and the ceramics, masks and the sculpture, the main one is mine. But yeah, I think it's interesting to work with somebody else to not only like feed off their ideas but to also kind of push back and to like give them ideas as well too. But um, I don't know, I think collaboration is really integral to people's practice and uh, we shouldn't look down on it. And then I was invited to do a show at Fons Welter's gallery, so I was like kept on taking that idea of using like something that should be a wall, like brick, but then like compacting it into something that could give sentience or like animateness to like a something that is um, a head or something like that. Or and, like also on one of these um, faces, it's like taking script from Edgar Heaper Birds and thinking about who writes history, who writes, who's in art history, who, and who's left out, and stuff like that. So that's something I'm thinking about as well. Take another detail shot of the installation. This is uh, like around, you know, like January 2018, and, and Trump already started to restrict the historical landmark status of Gran Escalante in New Mexico and, and Utah. Actually, it's in Utah, I'm sorry. Um, and so that was all so then they could get access to the oil, gas, and tar sands in that area. And, and you're talking about sites that have like ancient art there, ancient American art for the, like the Navajo people. So one of the things that I wanted to represent within my work is mapping and to locate these sites of, of not only cultural extraction, but also resource extraction as well. Um, some of the people that are involved in like this resource extraction are the Koch brothers that are actually funding uh, Donald Trump's uh, re-election campaign. They own uh, $115 billion from their uh, oil oil and gas fortune, but they also run, as you see on the right, uh, Quilted Northern and a lot of paper products, Brawny and these gas companies. So, and they, but they also run super PACs and consulting groups that can gather up information on how to target certain people and then use that information to then suppress voting in certain cases, but then also to 
uh, get people to have apathy about the whole process of voting. I mean, Americans are one of the least likely to vote. So I don't know, I just think that right now our country is sort of an, an oligarchic state where only a small handful of people are owning the vast majority of wealth and that needs to change. So um, the picture in the middle is a map of the Keystone XL pipeline, which they have their hand in as well. So um, you just have to follow the money sometimes that leads you to, to things. So this is sort of like a map of of the um, Keystone XL and where it kind of goes. So it's sort of like explicit, but also kind of um, not that way. So um, this is kind of like an install shot of my studio at the Rice Academy. Yeah, I don't know. This, I don't know what to say. And, um, this is like an image of me in my studio working right before my final Reichs open. So, this is that point. Yeah. So you can kind of see what my studio was like. I just had like a lot of stuff going around, a lot of sculpture. I had access to like a CNC router and then also just a wood shop and ceramic shop. So I was just goofing around with as much different materials as possible, so, yeah. But this is also, like, I, I was talking to some of you guys today about projecting images, and I don't know, I kind of think of my studio as sort of like a cave that I kind of project images, so it's sort of like a weird fusion between Vermeer, but then also, like, cave painting, too. So, I don't know. And then this was, like, the final result of it. Um, I guess I was feeling, like, pretty scared and, like, in, like, I didn't really have that good of an experience in the Netherlands. I felt like a lot of racism um, in the gallery world there. I, like, people would say really bad stuff to me, and I just had to let it, I just had to laugh at them. <laughs> so, uh, this is just kind of my way to just kind of hold space for myself and uh, kind of think about global warming, but to also think about what it, what it just means to, just to be a human being right now, I guess. I don't know. And a lot of like, these forms, if you guys have questions too, it's you guys can ask, just yell at me and be like, you're full of shit, or like whatever, I don't know. Um, yeah, so I was just like looking at a lot of um, cave paintings for th these forms and like hybridizing them into sculpture, like imagining what some of these figures would look like as sculpture, just in case if they do get destroyed. Like, how could I kind of give them, like, a second life or something like that? So I would make them, like, small, like, probably, like, a little monito, like, a little thing like this, and then scan them on the computer, like, take 360 photographs, and, like, blow them up uh, with different software, and then, ha like, with sheets, like, cut them out with the CNC router, and then do glitches or interruptions in the layers before I uh, put them together, so, yeah. This is uh, like a window treatment. Um, I did get to go to uh, Matisse's church. I think it's like in Nice or something like that. But that was sort of like the vibe I wanted for this room was like my weird, crazy gesture towards like some higher spiritual realm, but like through like some church-like stained glass setting or something like that. And thinking about our relationship to the sun as well and heat. It was like a lot about heat, but also circulation or something like that, so this is another view of the room. And this is like all the images from that. Um, so right before the Rex open happened, my final one, I like took my mom and my dog Sancho to uh, uh, Bandelier National Monument in New Mexico. And it was like one of the last places that I went with my dad before he passed. And um, I just went around and did like a lot of observational painting there. And I went inside one of the caves and did like observational painting from inside the cave. 
and then I brought back all of like these small images and then I like projected it onto a canvas. So it's almost like it looked like it was like an ancient telescope through a cave or something like that, and then I fused it with like the spiral motif that is in the rocks there in, in Bandelier and, and kind of like used it as a way to undermine like manifest destiny in landscape painting because like in American landscape painting there's like Albert Bierstadt, the Luminous Painters, the Hudson River School, even now to like people like Alex Katz that are basically either making it very sublime and like very palatable uh, or showing how nature needs to get tamed to like single point Cartesian perspective and like how it's wild and we need to, to tame it or we need to like you know, I don't know, shame it or something like that. So for me, I just kind of want to interrupt that like single point linear Cartesian perspective and to throw it into a spiral. Um, so, yeah. And then the border crisis happened and um, where, like, or the migrant, migrant caravan, whatever propaganda that you want to call it, uh, happened and then I decided to make like this, this installation and like I, I was thinking about like the children that were like in captivity there and that are still in captivity today and trying to give them a voice too because this stuff isn't just happening here it's happening in Europe with like Syrian refugees and it's all because of climate change and and yeah anyways I could go off but I'm not gonna there's like a detailed shot of that Uh, so yeah, it's just like the same process of making small little like clay dolls and then like scanning them in the computer and then like um, blowing it up and then like intervening in the CNC routing procedure um, and using like the same wood like poplar wood that they use for kachina dolls but instead for like this procedure of like saving or like keeping these cave paintings alive in three-dimensional form or something like that. And then I got done with Europe, and, I, and my, my partner Heidi Howard was like, let's go to New Mexico, and we were like, all right, yeah, that sounds great. So we spent like, a year ago, I was in New Mexico hanging out with these people, uh, these psychos, no, and they're really smart, really nice people. Uh, Paula Wilson and Mike Lag, they run this residency Mama Zozo, which is really, really cool, and you guys should apply for it. Um, Paula Wilson went to Columbia years before I did, but she and Mike are running like this this residency that's also open 24-7 to residents of Carrizozo, and they, there's like this movie theater that was falling down, and they ended up like using it as a platform for art and just conversations, and it's, it's actually really close to Texas too, so a lot of people voted for Trump there, and I got to meet them and trying to like persuade them and even like a lot of Latinos and, and Native Americans that ended up voting, or actually just Latinos, not Native Americans, voted for him that I met, and I was just trying to convince them about like, how has life gotten any better for you guys at all? And I, it's, I think it was like a good opportunity for me to also check myself and my own like, urban biases and stuff like that, but um, anyways, long story short, it was good residency. Um, and so like every day, like I would go outside and like paint from observation, the Sierra Blanca Mountains, which are the ancestral home of like the Apache, the Mescalero Apaches that um, I'm related to, that I wanted to kind of figure out a way to actually have like real juice and vibrance to like the landscape that I'm talking about. So the cave painting of the figure that I made into three-dimensional form uh, came from like this environment, but then just kind of turned into flat again. Another painter that I, I should talk about too um, is Joan Mitchell. I probably said that already, um, but I really love Joan Mitchell. Her paintings are really, really good. And I kind of steal a lot of her moves too. And then this is uh, my first solo show ever in New York City. It was with Boers Lee Gallery, and uh, Michelle is here, who runs the gallery. What happened? Uh, and this this was uh, the my first solo show, but it, it, it was really cool, and I don't know, I had, a, I had a blast, and they let me do whatever the hell I wanted to do, which is really rare. <laughs> and uh, it was really fun doing the installation with, the, with, with them, and I also collaborated with my partner, Heidi Howard, and it just turned out to be like a really, really interesting exercise. Like I didn't, like for instance, like I didn't want to put my, my sculpture on the bricks, and Heidi was like, do it, and then we did it, and it looked great, so anyways. 
Um, so we did this installation, and um, it just all came together really nice. Um, some of like they're like pottery shards from El, El uh, Rito in Mexico too. So I don't know. I'm, it's fusing things that are like really old with things that are more modern too is something that I'm interested in. And so that that painting right here I showed earlier, I sampled like John Quick to see Smith's uh, fear painting, and then like the New York Times like came and interviewed me about the show. And I told them, like, yeah, this painting, I was like really inspired by John Quick to see Smith, I sampled it. And then they publish it, and then, like weeks later, John is like, oh my god, like, you, gotta, you gotta come and visit me. Blah, blah, blah. And I was like, okay. So then I went out to New Mexico this summer, and we just hung out. My mom got to meet her. I, my mom is like a union organizer, she's not from the art world at all. So, like, it was actually really fun just to hang out with her. And I don't know, it's just cool to, to meet your idols sometimes, and they don't disappoint sometimes. So I don't know. I was just thinking about like the separation of the reason why I sampled it was because it's like the separation of, of children from their from their moms and stuff like that, and just to kind of make that into some type of form. And this is uh, an installation shot from Freeze uh, that I did with Bowersley. Um, yeah, yeah, that was fun to do. And then this is uh, an install shot from the show that I did over the summer with the Drawing Center. I, I'm i getting like uh, kicked out of like this studio in Long Island City right now. And so like I really did a lot of like frittage of like the, the floorboards and stuff like that, but then also my bodily movements of trying to feel free in like a painted space, even if I'm gonna get kicked out. So this that's sort of where I came from. And, maybe connections to the earth as well too. But this is just like a drawing on paper with um, uh, porcelain and um, yeah, hemp yarn. And then um, also this summer, I got to go out in, uh, to the petroglyphs in New Mexico. This is uh, Cienega uh, petroglyphs. So I like, uh, I got like a can I got like a canvas and then it, like a five foot by five foot, then like cut it in half and then like folded it like a suitcase and then like brought it up into the into the hills. And this is my mom. My mom's like like this tall or something like that. And I'm like, mom, just stay in the car. She's like, no, me, don't let me take a photo. I'm like, shut up. No, oh, no, I didn't say shut up. She's a really sweet woman um, and really amazing. And um, she'd do anything for me. So I just hope I, I honor her memory tonight and don't say anything bad about her because she's awesome. Um, but yeah, anyway, so I made the transition also to acrylic painting um, when I came back to the United States because I was just thinking about John Quick to see and how she's like, you gotta, it's better for your health and it's better for the environment, you know, so, but yeah, so I just really like painting outdoors too. Can you hear that? Very right, cool. Um, so these are like the final things, final images. Um, but this is from my show at the Drawing Center that's up right now until January 4th. It's really close by to here. Um, but uh, yeah, I guess I was thinking about that blue line is actually where Sandy uh, hit and where the water was in like lower Manhattan um, in Sandy in like 2012, 2013, something like that. So yeah, that's sort of. And also, like a, that could be like a map on the left or something like that too. Uh, yeah. uh, cool. And this is like a, a new painting I just finished this week. Um, but yeah, it's still taking like the floorboards and like doing the frittage thing and like tracing it, but then like masking out parts. I went to China this summer and um, I just saw like the like this ancient Buddha sculpture that's like the biggest Buddha in the world before the one that the Taliban destroyed in Afghanistan. But I just really liked just to see how like, like a, a form could be like carved into like the, a rock face, and, but then you still see like the actual place that it, it was made to. So and so then I sewed and cut holes in the canvas and stuff like that. So I just like mixing and matching. I was talking to somebody today um, about Joseph Cornell, and I just really love Joseph Cornell a lot too. That's another person that I'll share with you guys 
He's a great guy to look at to get inspired. And Yayo Kasuma, they used to date. She's really great too. Um, this is my final slide. I like to keep my presentation short because I have a short attention span. Um, but I don't know, with all the crazy shit going on in the world right now, um, sometimes I go to the people that my dad, so my dad, uh, he's like there on like the right, he's like doing security for Angela Davis uh, in the 70s when she was teaching at UCLA. And um, uh, she was also teaching with Herbert Marcuse, um, Frankfurt theory of uh, Marxism. And uh, Ronald Reagan uh, fired her illegally, so then they did a lot of protests and stuff like that, part of like the Chicano movement, then linked up with like the Black Panther movement. And the, the point of all this is that, you know, even in the darkest days of what's going on right now, if we just kind of band together and see who our allies are and not necessarily our enemies, we can actually make things better, I think. Um, and one last thing too, like Edgar Heber said, like, for like Native Americans, if we've survived Custer and Columbus, we can survive Trump, so. Yeah, that's it, man. But uh, I just want to send that off on that note, but there is hope. So anyways, whatever. Thank you guys so much for inviting me. Woo, Hunter! All right, come on. Thank you. There, are, there are no stupid questions, by the way, too. Yeah. Hey, uh, this is funny. Uh, uh, when you can talk more about the disconnecting and uh, like you have other programs like Bob uh, that you also know it's like making work to make when you go back and you come from working like, in the Netherlands and you know, that's like that's really classified as a slavery. Uh, it, it must it just sounds like yeah, I think they're they're ready for that criticism. Um, so whatever you kind of wage against them, they're always ready. But they're actually not ready. They still do like the Swarter Pete thing at Christmas, which is really strange. Um, look it up, Swarter Pete. That's really weird. Um, but like, I think the facilities that they have there are really really great. I had a, I had a really good time, like just walking into like their wood shop or metal shop and just doing whatever I wanted to do. That was really amazing. And they bring by like a lot of really cool people like Sir Ralph and Pepe, who did um, studio visits and stuff like that that I'm still you know, friends with. And yeah, I don't know. I think it was just good to get out of America for a little bit. I didn't know that Trump was going to become president. It wasn't like I was running away. It just like happened. And then my dad passed. And then it was like, all right, he wanted me to go to Europe for the first time and go there, so I'm going to go. And uh, it was not what I expected at all. And I think it actually helped me realize what I love about America. And even though it's like really fucked up right now, it's like really cool fucked upness thing. So I, I, I think it's a, it's a good thing to help you appreciate what America has. And, and especially in New York, I think the painting scene here in New York is so much better than in Amsterdam. Um, but if you want to kind of get keyed into what Europe is like, I think it's a good gateway to it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so one of the reasons why I kind of have them in pieces is so then they can like get disassembled and fit inside of a kiln, but then be modular enough to like get reassembled and stuff like that. Because the Reichs Academy had like kilns that could facilitate something really large, like a car almost. Um, but in order to kind of keep like that nomadic quality that I want and not so much like a, a permanent monolith is so then it could be like taken down and like and like be modular and move around space and to kind of not be so permanent in a way. But that's a good question. Um, yeah. I think it's important to kind of have a sculpture that doesn't always like stand so monumental but can kind of be mobile. Yeah. Uh, earlier you were talking about the kind of nervous laughter that comes to comments that are romantic from certain people who are not aware of what they're having. I'm curious if that kind of nervous laughter translates sometimes to that moment of pain happening. Uh, 
Sometimes that it can't, the pain never solves anything, but it just keeps asking more and more questions of things, especially in the process of making. And it's like this, this weird path that takes you down different routes and stuff like that, but it can kind of have the power to point at things sometimes that you never intended in the first place. And then how can you kind of, even though it's like really like mind numbing or like just, um, a lot of doubt can happen and, and that, that like nervousness that you're having to speak to history and stuff like that. But I think it's only dead if you think it's dead and that like if you can kind of like activate it in a way that's really special for yourself and then hopefully that radiates to other people. But I think that's a really good question too. Um, and I think it's probably gonna be one I answer for the rest of my life too. Thank you. It's a good question. Well, thank you guys so much.